Table Chain podcast and I'm really excited today to be joined by uh, Julie Jones. Hi, Julie. Hi, nice to be here. Thank you so much for giving up some time on a Saturday afternoon. I know how busy you are. Uh, so Julie's uh, here from Travel Without Limits and Have Wheelchair Will Travel. So we'll start, Julie, if you can just give us a little bit of background about yourself and your journey to this point. Sure. Well, I used to work in the travel industry, so travel is a real passion of mine. My parents took me traveling at a young age for six months around Europe and Scandinavia and really instilled a a passion for travel. And I always imagined we would do the same with our children. And my son, Brayden, was born with cerebral palsy. He's a wheelchair user and needs help with all his daily living needs. So when a wheelchair became part of our luggage, it was a whole different ball game. And despite having worked in the travel industry for so many years, I was just really worried about how we would do it and what impact that would have and didn't find very much information about it. So we took some sort of gentle steps into the travel realm and really enjoyed it and found that, you know, week day in, day out, we were just doing therapy. Early intervention was, you know, the buzzword and we knew that we needed to do as much as possible. But I became a bit of a a mouse on a wheel and really tired and burnt out. And we found that travel really reminded us that we weren't just carers and admin people for Brayden, that we were his parents. And, you know, my daughter had come along by that time. So it was really important for her to have those times together as a family bonding. And I started Have Wheelchair Will Travel basically after a trip to the US. We won a trip. And we were like, oh, how are we going to do this? And there wasn't much information online, but I researched it like a travel agent would. (laughs) And um, we had the most amazing time. It was the most liberating feeling to actually travel, for it to be successful, for the wheelchair not to be a barrier. And we wanted to share that with other people. So I started Have Wheelchair World Travel to give them tips um, on how to do it. And then I kind of got niggly and thought, that's not enough. We need more. We need it in mainstream media. So I started writing for some family publications and then I kind of thought, "Mm, that's still not enough. One story (laughs) in each issue and was lucky that the person that I was writing for at a family publication was keen to co-found a publication, which is Travel Without Limits, which is Australia's first disability specific travel magazine. And the magazine is dedicated to all kinds of travel, whether it's what you're traveling with somebody with autism or somebody who has a degenerative disease or somebody who is blind, deaf, we sort of try and cover a range of topics and everything's written by people with lived experience because I'm a firm believer in the people who are traveling with a disability or a condition are the best people to help other people feel confident that the information is accurate and can be followed and hopefully it helps them. So that's kind of me in a little big nutshell. (laughs) Fabulous. So how old are your children? So my son's 26 now and my daughter's 19. Wow. Okay. So you've got lots of experience. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I mean, we've done lots of travel and, and as I said, we started off very gingerly, um, you know, with local trips and then a cruise and, you know, just took baby steps really to work out what yeah. we needed. And and then we sort of launched into bigger travels and more adventurous. And, wow. you know, with, with those more adventurous trips, some things work, some things don't. But I yeah. think as long as you pack your positive attitude, and that's for anyone really, I don't think it's just, you know, if you have a disability, but realistically, it's harder to overcome some of the challenges if you have a disability and you arrive somewhere and things don't go right. Yeah. And I know uh, during the, the Paralympics, we heard about, you know, wheelchairs not being put onto planes and or being left and, you know, damaged in the process of travel. So, yeah, that would definitely um, add to the stresses, I would imagine. Well, I think it's a little unfortunate because, yes, those things definitely happen. And if they happen, it's catastrophic for people. Yeah. I mean, if you arrive at your destination and your wheelchair is damaged beyond use or damaged you know significantly that's like somebody arriving at a destination with broken legs like yep. it's your way of getting around and the way that you feel comfortable getting around but I do think that the media tends to like two two very um extreme ends of the stories around disability they like the worst possible stories which they love to put on the front page of course and they like the most um inspirational stories which doesn't really represent 
you know, 99% of yeah. the population. So, you yeah. know, it's fantastic when you see Kurt Fanley doing the Kokoda Trail or climbing the Harbour Bridge, and that's brilliant. But the fact is that most people with disability aren't going to be able to yeah. achieve those things. Yeah. And that's what the media tends to, yeah. you know, um, it's the highlight. Extremes. Extremes, yeah. as you said. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So today we're going to talk about um, some of the challenges around traveling with someone with a disability and also some solutions to those challenges. Um, and then at the end, we're going to hear your top tips for traveling with someone for, with a disability. So that's going to be a great, uh, a great tool and some tips that people can put into practical life. Um, so what are some of the challenges that you have faced and that you've had to consider whilst traveling with your son? I think one of the biggest challenges is a lack of information. Um, and even if there is information, it's often quite hidden. It's under frequently asked questions or it could be, you know, you've got to go through multiple clicks. It's not just on a tab that says accessible information, which would be super useful for people. So that's the first thing. Um, you know, you can't just book things online and expect that they're going to work for you, even if it is accessible in some way, shape or form. Um, because everyone's idea of accessible is quite different. Yeah. Uh, so then that leads me to what is one of the biggest challenges is in the tourism industry, there's a lack of understanding. And to a degree, there's a bit of a fear. I think of um, people don't want to sort of promise too much, which I think is, is wise, but then they also don't share enough for us to get an idea of, of yeah. what there is. So that's a real problem. And even, you know, I research everything to the nth degree and we, I'd say 99% of the time have really positive experiences. So one of the challenges is just putting in the time to research and plan a trip, but you do know that that will pay off at the yep. other end, but that's the time that you need to put in. And that's exhausting when you're trying to work that round, you know, therapy, doctor's appointments, daily life, jobs, you know, all those sorts of things. So that's a big one. And even, you know, as an example that I often use, we were trying to book a holiday to Cairns. And I was ringing the various properties and one of the properties I said, you know, is it accessible to the apartment? And they said, yes, we have a lift. And I said, right, so that's step free. And she said, oh, no, there's five steps to the lift. So, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we tend to bump our son's chair upstairs if we absolutely have to, but certainly as we're getting older and he's getting heavier, it's not ideal. And if you imagine when you're staying at a property, sometimes you come and grow from it, you know, several times a day, bumping it up five stairs to get to a lift yeah. would have been bad for us, but it would yeah. have been impossible for somebody in a power wheelchair or, you know, just, you know, somebody who even has a bad hip or a bad knee that's looking for a fully accessible experience. So they're the challenges that we often face um, in that regard. But we are finding that you know, with the airlines from when Braden was young and we were first flying with him to now, we have to explain a lot less, which I think is fantastic. Yep. So I think there is a growing awareness, but it's never fast enough for the people that need it. No, because the people that need it need it now. Exactly. <laughs> Not once it's Yesterday. changed. Yeah. <laughs> um, is there a uh, like a, an industry standard or some kind of regulatory board that, you know, if someone says they're accessible, is that actually checked and authenticated by anyone or anything no I think at the moment very much it's it's left to I mean there's certain standards as far as if you have an accessible say apartment yeah um then you'll have certain door widths and and certain bathroom um yeah. requirements but in saying that there's a lot of older properties that kind of renovate on their own or you know in some places use the term wheelchair friendly which I understand why they use that term, but it's kind of a weak term. And so I always say if we're giving advice to anyone who's wanting to, you know, provide information is provide photos and provide measurements and then people can decide for themselves whether yeah. it's accessible or not because some of the experiences we do are not at all accessible. And when we go on a holiday, we'll have um, what I would call a high-impact day. So it might be a day... As an example, when we're in New Zealand, we did the Skyline, which is a luge ride. Wow. And the gondolas are accessible. But, of course, the luge ride that our family really wanted to do was at the very top of the mountain. And there was like a chair lift up, but we needed a wheelchair to then, you know, get 
certain points. So yeah. we bumped the wheel or walked the wheelchair up this really steep incline, left the wheelchair at the top, took the luge down. Then my husband waited until I went back, walked back up, grabbed the, wow. the wheelchair and then came back down again. So that would be a high impact day, but we knew that my our family's enjoyment and my son's enjoyment was worth that. But then it would might mean that the next day we look for just a very easy, accessible walk. Yeah. So I always say to people, don't tell me what's accessible, show me what the yeah. accessibility is like, because it might be something that we can manage. Yeah. Or my son can transfer out of his wheelchair and get onto a boat, for example. Um so it's it's just understanding people need to understand there's no one size fits all uh, with any disability yeah. because people have really different requirements and yeah. really different attitudes. Um, and it could just be where you are mentally at the time. Like sometimes I just don't have the energy to do anything but something that is truly accessible. Yeah. So I think that comes into play as well, sort of where you're at with your yeah. sort of mental strength, not just physical strength. <laughs> Yeah, and I imagine it, it's, as you said, it's physically tiring if you're having to do those activities, you know, more than once to enable yourself to, to then move the wheelchair. Um, that's a strain on, on you physically as well as emotionally. Yeah, and I think some people are also having to do quite a lot of their um, at-home routine when they're away. So whether that's, um, I don't know, continence care or you know, other wellbeing care while they're actually away yeah. as well as their sightseeing. So it's not just like they're just walking out the door carefree. Yeah. You know, people often have to take a lot of what they do at home away with them. Yeah, it's a lot of planning. Yeah. Yeah. That's fabulous. Thank you. Any any other challenges that you've come up against? Or with? Um, I think equipment as well. So yeah. my son has, for example, a specific toilet chair, commode chair that he uses at home that is comfortable, supports him, that sort of thing. And when we travel, we had to come up with a solution for for replicating that, but something that was portable because his yeah. is a fixed sort of system. Um, so that actually required building something ourselves because we couldn't find anything on the market that suited us yeah um so we actually built something uh it was pulling all different bits and pieces together and my husband you know doing some welding and some cutting and all sorts wow. of things <laughs> um but now we have a toilet seat that fits in a suitcase so yeah, fabulous. you know that's fantastic yeah. so often I think people are very good at coming up with inventive um you know solutions Make to creative yeah 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 um, I've got a question that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm all for asking the questions that, you know, maybe people don't know how to ask or don't want to ask or don't even consider. If you're traveling with a wheelchair, is that considered luggage? Is that an extra cost? Is that something that it gets taken into account? Like, how does that work? So most airlines allow you um, your usual luggage allowance and then two pieces of mobility equipment. Right. So you okay. have to check with the airline yeah. um, when we were traveling to New Zealand we had we actually asked for an extra bag of luggage because yeah. we're going for a few weeks and you know with the toilet taking out one whole bag and yeah. needing other bits and pieces so that had to go through a process um, but most I recommend everyone contact the airline special handling department yeah. Yeah. for any requests um, and some people, you know, we've traveled with sleep medication that required dry ice and there's regulations around that. If okay. people are traveling with oxygen, there's regulations around that. So there's a lot of different things that you need to check, but you can save yourself a lot of time if you're traveling with a wheelchair. Uh, if it's a power wheelchair, letting them know whether it's um, what kind of battery it has, because that's a big question and you sometimes have to get some kind of sign off for that from the airline. So you need time. Like it's yeah. not like you can spontaneously, you know, hop on a flight tomorrow yeah. if you've got a lot of requirements. Yeah. Um, and with our manual wheelchair, it's always the the weight of it and the dimensions of it. So if you have those handy, it saves you two phone calls. Yeah, excellent. So from what you're saying, there's a lot of, you know, making sure that you communicate your needs to whoever it is that you're traveling with as well well communication is absolutely yeah. key which i will get to in our five tips that's because i'm big on communication so that's why that jumped out to me <laughs> 
So are there any other challenges? Um, question. I mean, I think it depends where you travel to. There's definitely, you know, people often say to me, where's the your favourite place to challenge, to travel or where was the most accessible place that you travel? And I always say, well, the US has got um, Americans with Disability Act, which means that they have regulations in place um, to ensure you can get into even a very old building or, uh, you know, at Disneyland, there's certain rides that, you know, you can get into in your wheelchair, things like that. Um, but Fiji stands out as one that was not physically particularly accessible. There were no sort of cutouts on curbs. Yeah. There was, you know, lack of ramps and things like that. But the Fijian people were so inclusive that it made it an accessible holiday because, you um, you know, they came up with ways for my son to be involved with anything. When we arrived on a beach, although we'd put a free will attachment onto the front of my son's chair to try and make it easier to get across the sand, it was still hard going. And out of nowhere comes a Fiji and, and off he goes with his big muscles and gets my son <laughs> up the beach. And, you know, they found a little bungalow for us to use for changing in and, you know, all that sort of thing. So, you know, so much of the success of a trip comes down to your attitude but also to the attitude of the people around you. Yeah. But I honestly feel positivity breeds positivity. And I think that, you know, if even if you do have a problem, if you go about it in a nice way, people are far more likely to try and bend over yeah. backwards, um, yeah. you know, and they're not, you know, you want them to have a level of understanding of accessibility, but by the same token, they're not living your life. They don't know the ins and outs of your needs. So you know, you have to have some sort of understanding of that as yeah. well. And I guess that's where the, you know, my question about whether there's a standard because what might appear to be accessible for one person may not be accessible for another person, right? That's right. And yeah. it even comes down to what, what some people like and what some people don't like. So, for example, Brisbane Airport has put in a hidden disabilities program which is becoming more and more common, but I'm just particularly pointing out Brisbane's program. So they have a, I think it's a sunflower lanyard that you can apply for prior to getting there. So say you had a loved one with dementia or um, autism, something, anxiety, something that made the airport experience much more difficult for them yep. so that you can apply to get this lanyard sent out to you and sent out and the person can wear it and it just means that it's sort of like a little um, green light to security to take a little bit more time to be a little bit more understanding if there's a refusal to do something or resistance, things like that, and just to try and streamline the trip through the airport. Now, some people absolutely loved that idea and other people said, well, I don't want something around my neck yeah. that makes me different to everyone else. So, you know, it really is up to the individual as to how they feel about it. It's just yeah. a little bit like terminology. Um, I much prefer people to refer to Brayden, my son, as a wheelchair user or a person with a disability but a lot of people in the disability community actually prefer to be called a disabled person. So right. I feel like we all need to learn respect of yeah. what other people choose. Yeah. Um, and I have no problem if somebody else wants to, you know, refer to themselves in that way, as I would hope that they wouldn't have any problem with referring to Brayden in, yeah. you know, as a wheelchair user yeah. or person yeah. with a disability. Yeah. And I remember having a conversation with Mel about, um, you know, when people offer to help or don't offer to help. Um, but then when you say, yes, please, making that assumption of how that help looks rather yeah. than saying, like, how can I help? Um, exactly. I, I know when I interviewed her, she was saying that, you know, someone had said to her, she was, she was going through a doorway and she was holding a coffee and someone had said, would you like me to help? And she said, yes, please. And they held the door open for her. What she actually wanted help with was someone to hold her coffee while coffee. she opened the door. Yeah. Um, so, and, and that really struck a nerve with me about, and whether it's a person with a disability or not, how we offer help and the way that that, and not making assumptions about how that help looks. Well, person. I always say I always say to people, I'm so appreciative if somebody offers to help me with Brayden and I always show that appreciation, even if I don't want the help, simply because I want to make sure that the next person they that they do offer the help to the next yeah. person they come along, rather than feeling like, oh, I did the wrong thing, I shouldn't do that. 
And I always use the example of if I saw anyone who couldn't reach the top shelf in the supermarket struggling to get groceries, I'd say, oh, gosh, that's high. Would you like a hand? And I would hope that that would be taken in a good way. I hope yeah. that they wouldn't see that as me saying, oh, you're too short, you can't get it. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, like it's yeah. just, um, I think we have to remember to be sensitive but also to to kind of understand that in different ways we do exactly the same thing with everyone. It's yeah. not just, you know, somebody saying to me as a woman pushing my son who's 26, do you need a hand with that? I think, well, I hope they'd offer to help the maybe older lady who's unsure of where she's going if she needed help. Yeah, so I think um, political correctness has just made it very very tricky for people to offer help often. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And and I know that, that, like I said, that conversation I had with Mel made me think about, you know, when my my kids are doing their homework, um, me saying, you look like you're struggling, would you like some help? And them saying, yes, please, I would naturally jump in with what I thought the solution was to helping them. In, yes. And then they go, no, I, I know that, but I didn't understand this part. And, and it's made me really aware of, like I said before, how, how we communicate what that help is and what, what the person actually needs from us. And that's a fantastic thing about having podcasts like this and having these conversations is that you do hope that you don't just take it away for one situation in life, that yep. you can more broadly use it across the board. Yeah. Yes. Um, so the, obviously you've touched on some of the solutions such as, you know, becoming innovative and creative and <laughs> whatever you need to do to, to be able to travel. Are there any other solutions that you can that offer that you've come up with? Um, I, th- I mean, I think a lot of them are very obvious as in talking to other people in the in your community. So, you know, people that you might know or tapping into Facebook pages. I mean, there's lots of Facebook pages now where people share information. And I just think you never think it's a dumb question. And sometimes in my I Have Wheelchair Will Travel Facebook group, I'll ask a question and then all these people will say, oh, following so you then know, oh, all these other people actually yeah. want to know the answer to this yeah. as well. Um, so I think there's a lot of information. I think research is absolute key. Um, you know, the more time you put into researching a trip, the more likely you are to have a successful trip. And, th- and that probably goes fair for everyone, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's really key. Communication is is key as well. And I think setting reasonable limits. So if you're an unfit person, you wouldn't decide to run a 5K marathon tomorrow. And if you're new to traveling for whatever reason, if you have, you know, a degenerative condition, if you've just had a child that's, you know, become a wheelchair user, whatever else it is, set realistic goals, small goals, and then work up to something bigger. So, you know, I would have hated our first trip to be our trip to Disneyland because as much as it's wonderful, we had a whole pile of experience behind us before we actually embarked yeah. on that trip. Yeah. And I think that makes a big difference as to how successful you'll be yeah. and just have a, you know, I've already said positive mindset. I think that yeah. makes a big difference. Um, what else? I just think, yeah, the, I, I think realistic goals is the most important though. Yeah. And, and that's different for everyone, right? what's realistic for you is is different to another family or a a couple or you know as you said before someone that's new to traveling yeah and I think um you know what what you think will actually give you what you need at that time out of a holiday so sometimes for us it might just be a beach holiday where we don't do very much but making sure that wherever we're going there's going to be a beach wheelchair and easy access and what we need um I prioritize now somewhere where we can walk out the door with the wheelchair. So we will often pay more for accommodation. Say, as an example, San Francisco, we paid fortune for accommodation because I wanted to just be able to wheel out the door and not call valet to bring the car from whichever yeah, car okay. park they had it on and then load the wheelchair in and out and, you know, all the rest of it. So over time we've learned what makes a good holiday for us. Yep. Um, and we might skimp somewhere else, but if for that particular stay, we knew that we would maximise our time if we chose a hotel in a good location where we could actually just wheel out the door. 
yeah um and have things right on our doorstep uh so but that all takes time yeah and that's why you know <laughs> when I get to my tips um <laughs> I think it's oh, I know teaser teaser <laughs> I, I yeah I think it's important to learn a few things and really reflect on what you want out of a holiday yeah do you um when you plan to go away is that something you know do you do you sit down as a family and talk about what you want out of that particular trip not usually I mean usually it starts I guess because of my travel background with me researching or being aware of a destination so with Fiji for example I knew everyone would be on board with that as a destination but I didn't want to flag it as an option until I'd actually researched what we could do when we got there because in Fiji we were going to be without a beach wheelchair Okay. So it really meant that what we would normally do if we went, say, to Port Macquarie, we weren't going to be able to do in Fiji. We weren't going to be able to go for long walks on the beach with a beach wheelchair at sunrise and sunset and all the rest of it. So I had to have X number of activities that I knew would be attractive to the whole family that we could do. And that actually required me contacting each operator. So we went quad biking in Fiji. And that was the first time Braden had gone quad biking. It was quad bike tour. And it was um, so you could have two people, two seater quad bike. And we had to contact them because we knew Braden can't sit on a quad bike by himself for a yeah. tour. And they said, well, when you get to Fiji, come to us and we can set, like, we can see what we can set up. Right. And so I thought, okay, well, they've got an open mind. Yeah. So if we can make it work. They're not going to say oh and s won't let you do it or you know. are so beautiful like you said before they would I know. They, they would they would sit there with you and hold your hand if they needed to <laughs> exactly so we took non-slip mat to go under Braden's bottom yeah. we took a luggage and oki straps to be able to tie him onto the back of the quad bike wow and then we went with all that gear to the the tour place and we sat Braden on the bike. They said, okay, we'll come, we'll do a lap of the streets around and see how he sits to make it sure he's okay. And it all worked well. And they went, okay, come back in three days' time. We're back in three days' time. And a tour group's normally quite big. And it was going to be, I think, a two-hour tour or something. So it's quite long for somebody yeah. with Braden and cerebral palsy to sort of sit on the back of the bike. And they said, oh, look, we've decided to give you a tour guide to yourselves as a family. And then you can go at your own pace. Wow. So, you know, they really went out of their yeah. way. So we sort of, before we went, though, we knew that tour. We had another, um, it was like a, a electric bike tour on an old railway track, plantation yeah. railway track tour that we wanted to do. Again, it was a long tour. Um, we weren't sure that it was going to work. So we had to drive like an hour and a half from where we were staying to go down there to see whether it was going to work. Again, we went with our Oki straps and we went with, you know, our non-slip mat. And then we found Braden's legs were dangling, <laughs> which isn't a big deal for most people, but we knew for him his stability yeah. comes from having his feet planted yeah. on the ground securely. And we said to them, oh, have you got something? And we saw a styrofoam box. So could we put that under his feet? And they're like, yep, come back Friday. You know, you can do the tour. Came back Friday and the Fijians had actually made a stool for him the right oh. height to go under his feet That's we so did lovely. the tour it was a massive success Braden was comfortable we had a fantastic yeah. time yeah. but I had you know multiple conversations email conversations with people ahead of time yeah um because if we got to Fiji and we couldn't do all those things or I hadn't pre-planned it or hadn't made contact ahead of time you know yeah chances were it would have been no so um it does take a lot of work and you're obviously <laughs> You obviously, I know this is one of your top tips, <laughs> but you're obviously going there knowing what the challenge is and also helping to provide the solution. Um, yes. And I think people are more willing to, to meet you where you need to be met if you're already helping to solve the problems. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. But in saying that, I mean, we don't, every trip is not like that. You no. know, we've done trips to Airbnbs, um, where we've just literally gone to the country and stayed in an Airbnb yeah. and our biggest requirement is that there's bath because unlike most people that are wheelchair users, Braden prefers a bath yeah. um, and a lounge that's long enough because Braden gets up in the wee hours in the morning and we need to have somewhere where we can chill in front of the TV and yeah. relax. So, you know, that's 
much easier to research yeah. but it's interesting how many properties don't actually have a bath anymore I know because I love a bath and I'm looking to go away and I'm I'm looking and a bath is because where I live doesn't have a bath so a bath is a, a huge a huge bonus for me yeah well <laughs> bath, bath and no step entry is a, yes. a tricky combination yeah. and you throw in those lounges <laughs> yeah and and often um you know what people think is no step there's actually a step to get into the bathroom exactly um, yeah or into the shower cubicle yeah. or whatever it might be I mean it's so. good with sites like Airbnb or stays all those ones because they tend to put a lot of images yes. but if they don't have all the images we've been inclined to ask for more so yeah yeah fabulous so are we on to the top tips <laughs> <laughs> all right so top tips that's quite hard to say fast top tips for traveling as a person or with a person with a disability. Yeah. So I think you really need to think about what, what kind of holiday you want, what it is you want to achieve. I think starting local is key. There's nothing wrong with a staycation. There's nothing wrong with, you know, a trip an hour away from home. So if you forget something vital or it doesn't work, you can actually come home because yep. you just it's like a safety, a safety blanket um, to know that you can do that. And it's really important to work out what you need, what equipment is essential, what's superfluous, what, you know, what is really only adding to your luggage limit and not serving you well when you're yep. away um, because everything becomes, you know, just more to carry, more to lug around. Um, if you're going somewhere like, say, Uluru or Cairns, somewhere where um, is very, very popular, it's I find it's very important to make sure you book your car hire first before okay. your flights, which is kind of not what most people do. No. But for us, we have to have a car that will fit the wheelchair and our luggage. And in the past, we've always been traveling in school holiday periods, which is the most popular time. And we can get away with a non-modified vehicle, but modified vehicles, say in cans, there's only very few of them. Um, so it's really important to book that. And if it's a refundable deal, you know, in most car hire, it's quite easy to get a refund. Yep. Then if you can't get your flights or you need to shift your dates, you can. But if you can't get around once you get to a destination, that's a massive problem. That's a great tip. Um, so, yeah, so car hire first yep. and then you book everything else around that. Okay. Um, accommodation you know as much as we love to book things online as a society it's not the best way to go if you have a disability you really need to ring if you're booking somewhere like a Sheraton a Hilton a Marriott don't ring their central reservations number you need to ring the hotel and ask questions of the staff that are on site because if you ring Sheraton's main bar that is located in Hawaii and you're asking questions about Sheraton at Port Douglas, they're not going to have a clue. They have not cited those rooms. They cannot give you more information. I'm um, smiling because I just did that yesterday with a Novotel and I think I called the Philippines um, yeah. and I was asking about a bath, ironically, um, yeah. and she said she was basically reading to me from the website yeah. So yeah. Um, and, and pressuring me to book over the phone and I yes. was like well I'm not going to do that um because you can't answer the questions that I need answered basically yeah yeah and if people are worried about say they've seen a deal on what if but because they have a disability and they're worried about access and they want to say I really have to have an accessible room ring the hotel director and if they give you a different rate to the what if rate just say well I've seen this rate on what if most of the time they will match yep. the rate because they're paying what if a commission. Yeah. So they're quite happy to match the rate. So don't be, don't feel that you're going to miss out just by booking direct. Yeah. I think it's actually really good because they can put notes in about your booking. Um, also, if you can't get the information, so say they sound vague or you just are feeling not confident, go with your gut. If they don't sound confident, you have every right not to feel confident. Ask for photos. Yep. Now, you may not be able to get photos immediately because obviously if somebody's in that room, they can't go in and say, hey, I need to take photos of your bathroom. But <laughs> if you've got time up your sleeve and that goes back to the research and planning and booking ahead, then you should be able to get those photos and follow up. Like you deserve to get that information so you are booking with confidence because holidays are not cheap. So 
you really want it to go well, not just from the point of view of what it's going to cost you, but also for how you'll feel at the end if it has gone right. And so, I think if if where you're booking isn't prepared to do that for you, then you probably don't want to be staying there anyway, right? <laughs> probably, but I mean, sometimes people don't have a whole no. lot of choice, no. you know, and it's quite hard because Mel actually, the way I met Mel was she'd come across one of my reviews. Yep. Um, she was looking for accommodation in Alice Springs and was having the devil's own job of finding somewhere with accessible accommodation. And she came up to me and she said, I read your review and could book it. And, you know, she had yeah. the information. Um, and look for websites, you know. So on my website, when I first started it, I would just take photos of the rooms, give a description, that was it. And over time, my audience were very vocal in letting me know what they need, <laughs> which I love because it means that I can better serve them. Yep. Um, so now I provide measurements. If I That's possibly awesome. can have time sometimes yep. I'm just looking in an accessible room and I might not have much time but wherever I can I give them the height of the bed so people can know with confidence that they can transfer from their wheelchair to the bed I let them know if and these are questions to ask as well if 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 it's important to you yep. um the other thing is whether there's space on the bed for anyone traveling with a hoist a lot of bed bases are actually solid yeah and therefore you can't get a hoist under them yeah so people then travel with elephant feet or, you know, some kind of device that can elevate the bed for them yep. so they can get their hoist under. But if that's important to you, you need to ask the question. You know, with airlines, depending on a person's ability, Braden um, uses his wheelchair to the aircraft door and then he walks onto the aircraft. Some people can use the aisle chair, which is a really uncomfortable um, wheel airline provided wheelchair yep. that gets you onto the flight. But some airlines provide an Eagle passenger lifter, which is a hoist that the airline provides that takes you down the aisle and places you in the seat and it's apparently much more comfortable than slide boards or other things that people have used in the past. So try and ask those questions and educate you on what, educate yourself on what there is out there to make your travels easier yeah. um, because that helps. You know, airlines like Qantas and Virgin have an upper body torso harness. That's something that you need to request in advance because you have to sit in a certain seat because it has an anchor point like a right. child's car seat would. So they're all the things that, you know, again, booking in advance, speaking to special handling, telling them what you need, asking them what facilities they have. Um, if you book with a budget airline, you need to know the limitations of a budget airline. So yeah. Qantas is a full service airline there. Their terminals are much quieter for anyone that has sensory, you know, um, problems around lots of noise and busyness. The Qantas terminal is much quieter. Yep. Um, they're a full service airline, so they tend to take a bit more time. They tend to be a little bit more lenient with what they'll offer. Jetstar is a budget airline and we've had great experiences with them. Um, and Virgin, we've had great experiences, but Jetstar will not let, a, a, say, a power wheelchair user or somebody who has very high support needs use their wheelchair to the gate. Right. Um, so that can be, you know, a problem. Yeah. So it's really educating yourself on, I mean, communication, communicating to them, but also educating yourself on what the airlines yeah. offer. Yeah. Fabulous. Any more top tips? Oh, there's so many <laughs> top tips probably was a little out of the teaser because there are just so many just tips, <laughs> tips, tips all the tips. tips I know I think you know choosing it um I think I said the stay local uh, start local to work out what you need yeah. if you need things like hospital facilities um, you know, if you have a condition where you might need hospital, check what the facilities yeah. are in that town. So if you're not familiar, if you're going outside of, you know, Sydney or major yeah. a area, check what facilities are in the area. Yeah. Um, if you're traveling to the country or somewhere like that, where pharmacies close at night, make sure you have your medication yeah. with you. Um, even things like Panadol, Braden will only have, if he gets really sick, he'll only have liquid Panadol, which yeah. isn't something that I keep all the time but if we travel to the country I always make sure I have liquid Panadol with yep. me because if he gets really sick always have more medication than you need um, when you travel because if there are any delays you know you can't just nip into a pharmacy and yep. get what you need um, for things like that 
and or if you're traveling internationally obviously have a letter with you yep and take advantage of any of the discounts that are offered to you you know things like the australian companion card don't leave home without it <laughs> um in australia obviously yeah. because places like SeaWorld, um you know any of the major theaters all those places you can wear, use your companion card so your person that's supporting you goes in for free Excellent. which for places like sea world you know it's a massive yeah. yeah that's a big massive difference um i'm not sure whether virgin's still offering mm-hmm. they were offering 50 percent off obviously post-covid I, i'm not sure whether but they were offering 50 percent off for somebody traveling with you if Excellent. you were unable to travel by yourself yep. and Qantas have um a discount as well which you need to i have to actually get myself up to date with everything <laughs> post-covid because yeah it's you probably know, all changed yeah well it's not post-covid is it but i mean no. all the airlines were grounded yeah um because they were offering a discount as well okay that's great um, and the last thing i'd say is travel with a malaki because more and more places now um are locking their um accessible bathrooms <laughs> okay we like because yep. it means that they're cleaner and they're yep. more likely to be available to people that need yes. them. Yep. Um, so we keep Braden's Malak key on the back of his wheelchair. So whoever's with him, the Malak key is there yeah, and he has access to the bathrooms. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, and anyone obviously who has um, hoist needs for the bathroom or an adult change table, check the changing places yep. website to find out if, you know, when you're going somewhere, whether they have them, places like Taronga Zoo now has one. Yep. Um, you know, there's more um, Australia Zoo in Queensland has one. So it makes a big difference to people who do need either the hoist or the adult changing table to them yep. having a full day out. Yeah. So from what you're saying, and I'm going to summarise, <laughs> it's education, yeah. preparation and communication. Oh, very good. Thank I you. I like that. <laughs> You can use that. (laughs) ECP. (laughs) In any order. Um, Thank you so much. It's been really, really useful information and really educational. And I hope that, you know, for people listening, like we said before, if there's there's one or two things that you can take away that make things a little easier, uh, then then it's definitely that's that's our mission, right? Is to to help people. Um, So thank you. Also, they're just not alone. Like, I think it's really important to know that, you know, you're not alone. There's a lot of people having exactly the same difficulties you're having and tap into those people because often those people are the ones that have found really inventive solutions to them. It's That's amazing because I interviewed... Carrie, who is Dementia Darling, and we were talking about uh, she um, advocates for carers of people with dementia. Um, And we ended her podcast with exactly the same thing, is that you're not alone. There's other people who are going through exactly what you're going through. There's support, there's advice, there's, you know, there's people that will hold your hand, um, you know, whatever you need, whether it's a a gentle push or a a handhold or an ear or a shoulder, there's, there's someone else that's going through what you're going through um, and has the same questions and often has the answers to the questions that you've got. So it's interesting that, you know, it doesn't actually matter what field we're talking about. um, That's one of the, the biggest takeaways is that you're not alone. And there's people that want to help and assist. Well, if you think even when you're a, a you know a parent traveling for the first time with a toddler or a, <laughs> a baby, I mean, yeah. you, know, you seek out other parents. Yeah. Oh, is that yes. what you did? And yeah. you know, is that how you solved it? Everyone yeah. just you know loves that unique connection in life, no matter Absolutely. what your situation, no what it matter what stage you're at. Yeah, it's that connection to other humans that makes yeah. a difference. You know, yeah. and it really is different to just finding information on a hotel website or a. Yeah dementia website yeah. it's actually having somebody that is kind of a face for it or a, a, a just somebody that you can connect with real life experience so how do we find you, you can find me at have wheelchair will travel.net yep uh, or travelwithoutlimits.com.au magazine is available to subscribe to we and are beautiful it. My annual magazine, yeah. Um, I'm really proud of it because I really wanted something that was glossy and quality and so people with a disability felt like their travels were just as, you know, 
um, inspirational or aspirational as anyone else. So, um, yeah, really, really proud of it. Well, I know you sent me a copy and I said to you when we touched it before, I was like, it actually, like, it feels lovely to hold. Like, I'm a real, I'm very, I'm very tactile. Tactile. So I, you know, I can look stuff up online, but I love to hold books and and feel how things feel. And it is beautiful. It's, it's, yeah, it's really lovely. So you should Yeah, well, I think a lot of people are actually keeping them as almost like a reference book. Yeah. So they can, you know. I've got it just here, so. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So if they want to go to Hawaii or Fiji or wherever it is in the future, they've got that information, you know, at hand. So, Yeah. yeah. It's, you can tell it's your one of your babies. So thank it you. is. Um, so I will put all those details on our show notes. So afterwards, if you want to um, check Julie out and um, the websites and Facebook, are you on Insta as well? Uh, have World Travel Travels on the Insta. Yes. Okay, beautiful. Yep. So that's where people can find you. And, you know, I know that you'll be happy for me to say, you know, if you've got any questions or uh, things that you want to know about or for more information, then people can just reach you through one of those channels. So we will make sure that's all shared uh, when we, when we publish this. So thank you so much for your time, Julia. Really appreciate it. It's been lovely to have a chat and some great information and tips. So thank you very much. Well, thank you for having me.